Welcome into the CHGO White Sox post game show presented by Factor Meal Kits. Head over to factormeals.com slash CHGO SOX50 and use code CHGO SOX50 to get 50% off. That's code CHGO SOX at factormeals.com slash CHGO SOX to get 50% off your first factor box. Welcome into the CHGO White Sox post game show. I'm your host, Sean Anderson. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Alongside me is Herb Lawrence. Hello. Hello, he's our CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow the show at CHGO underscore White Sox. We're being produced today by Sarah. I don't even know if she can join and say, hey, hey, Sarah. Uh, and we will be later joined for, by our CHGO White Sox beat writer, Vinny Duber, who is live from Guaranteed Rate Field after a Chicago White Sox. Can I get a drum roll, Herb? Do you have any drums nearby? <laughs> I guess it's up in the left-hand corner. Win! The White Sox win 3-2. to two. Southside stand up. The Sox win 3-2 to two in a very thrilling game. Here is how it happened. Uh, it was a pitcher's duel so far, uh, or through five innings. Garrett Crochet was wonderful. Renato Lopez was wonderful for the Braves. But then in the bottom of the six, it seemed like Renato Lopez started to lose his control. He started walking some folks. He gave up a bunt single to my guy Andrew Benintendi, and then a bloop. Uh, RBI single from Gavin Sheets made it one nothing White Sox. And then Garrett Crochet left a slider that was middle of the zone. It was at the bottom of the zone, but it was still in the zone enough for Marcel Ozuna to take it out to left and just over Andrew Benintendi's outstretched glove going into the White Sox bullpen, tying it up at 1-1 in the top of the seventh. And then the bottom of the seventh, A.J. Minter comes in. Braden Shoemaker started the game at shortstop for the White Sox. And Paul DeYoung comes in as a pinch hitter and goes yard. He hits a solo shot. He makes it 2-1 to the Sox for the Sox in the bottom of the seventh. In the bottom of the eighth with Pierce Johnson pitching, uh, the White Sox were able to get on. Uh, Luis Robert Jr. was able to hit a double. Gavin Sheets walked, and then Andrew Vaughn, another bloop single for the Chicago White Sox, scores a run, making it 3-1 White Sox. And then Michael Copa gave us a scare as Marcel mm -hmm. Ozuna hit his second homer of the game. This one much further than the first one going well into the seats beyond the bullpen, and it made it 3-2, and that's how the White Sox won. Herb, how you feeling? Really good because they won, and they scratched a couple runs late where they needed to for the White Sox. I didn't, you know, coming to the series, I was going to say they're going 0-6. I didn't think Garrett Crochet would do this versus the Braves, and we'll get to him a little bit further, but his performance was great. But for the hitters to come through, I think they only had like seven hits, most of them singles. But for them to come through as they did today, um, your guy, Andrew Benintendi, uh, Andrew Benintendi, started the offense off as a leadoff hitter wants to do. He saw an opportunity to put down a bunt after a couple of horrid dispatches his first two times. First pitch of the game for him when he saw it, hits the left field for a garbage fly ball and then he strikes out on three straight pitches his second at bat versus Ronaldo Lopez third at bat and I think that second at bat he was thinking about doing the bunt on the first pitch but Ronaldo threw a curveball that he finally got over and then Andrew saw that uh, Riley was still playing him back so he's like all right cool you're gonna play me that deep I'm gonna get my free bunt and he starts the offense he on walks they produce the run uh, with uh, Luis Robert uh, getting him to third and then you get the bloop single by Gavin Sheets and then later you get another bloop single by Andrew Vaughn that's what you need you know a team that's not going to score a lot of runs sometimes needs to get lucky some little balls dropping in every once in a while hey it was a cold day but the White Sox grab a W three to two I'm in I'm I'm, I'm hyped about that even though I know this team's not going to be good this is this feels good to finally get off the schneid and stop talking about how bad this team is. Finally, we win versus the, one of the best teams in baseball. Finally, no, this the White I know Sox this have won a team. I know it's uh, yeah, what, American it's Giants, Chicago American Giants. Come on, guys. 
Yeah, there Ridiculous. you go. Uh, shout out to G Easy in the chat, uh, the two dollars super chat. You guys are great, but it's past my bedtime. Go socks. Uh, we appreciate the 88 people that are watching. Make sure you're hitting the thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribing to the CHGO Sports YouTube channel. If you aren't a diehard, you can check out allchgo.com to sign up to become a diehard today. We got a Discord chat where you get to chat with diehards like you. You also get a shirt from the CHGO locker of your choice. You get a nice uh, sticker pack and a membership card as well. We appreciate G Easy super chat. We appreciate everyone in the chat as well commenting 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 we have squish saying crochet is him uh you also got uh jeremy bradford saying de young's de young's gonna hit 30 homers uh and 40 rbis because that's the way the white Sox go with solo homers i guess uh, but i was getting texts in the group chat that paul de young's gonna become adam dunn with like 250 strikeouts and there he goes shutting everybody out Illinois State's finest, Stephen Nicholas's favorite White Sox. There you go, Mr. Hockey's favorite White Sox, uh, Paul DeYoung coming in clutch. And uh, it wasn't even the go-ahead run. I mean, thank God the White Sox were able to uh, get that bleeder to go through because Ozuna took that one absolutely. Mercy. I think we should start there. Uh, they mentioned on the broadcast, Steve Stone mainly mentioned that Pedro Grifol wanted to use Michael Kopech in a high leverage situation. We're going to have all the time in the world to talk about crochet, but I just think we have to focus in on that end of the game because it was so hectic. This was a yep. game where you really didn't have anyone taking uh, the true reins. Again, five scoreless innings to start off this game. There was a ton of pitching. It just seemed like the bats were extremely cold. Uh, and who wants to hit 99 when it's freezing cold out? Uh, and Michael Kopech came in with one out in the eighth inning, relieving John Brevia. There was runners at first and second. Again, this is in a 2-1 ball game uh, before the White Sox take a 3-1 lead in the eighth. He goes up against uh, Ozzie Albies and has a typical Michael Kopech at bat. Throws a ball, gets a foul off, makes it 1-1. Then another strike at 100, makes it 1-2. But then he's unable to hit the zone. Three straight balls. He walks Albies. And then uh, Austin Riley comes up on the first pitch. He hits a foul straight back. And then on the second pitch, another 99-mile-per-hour fastball is a ground into uh, another uh, GIDP. Uh, uh, he grounds into a double play. Moncada steps on the bag at third, makes the throw over to first. Uh, first off, uh, Michael Kopech in that eighth inning nails. I mean, I understand that he gets the walk to Albies. And I think it's more of him not having a secondary pitch, not a lot of sliders from Michael Kopech. If he could throw 101, he'll throw 101, I think, uh, 30 out of 38 times. So I don't know what you made of at least the eighth inning and the decision to use Kopech in a high leverage situation, because then they left him in for the ninth inning. And we see how that unraveled. But first, what did you think of first just the decision to go to Kopech when you had Brevia out there, one out, runners on first and second? I thought it was really tough to put Michael Kopech in that type of situation. You just had an emotional play where you thought you struck out Ronald Acuna Jr., which they did. He aced him. John Brebbia aced him on the bottom of the zone. And then you threw out uh, Kelnick trying to steal second. But you got neither of those two out. So everybody's hyped. Everybody's pissed. Brebbia is probably pissed. He can get the call from the ump. So it was a really tough spot for him to come in with runners on first and second. The tying runs behind him. Really tough for Ozzie Albies, all-star second baseman, coming up to the plate. And, yes, he got ahead early, but you saw exactly why Michael Kopech isn't in the rotation right now. Wild in the zone, wild out of the zone, like trying to just throw the ball through Martin Maldonado, and then those balls were just way up. Like, ball three and ball four weren't even close to the plate. So he had to calm himself down and get back to – Bases loaded, going against the birthday boy, Austin Riley, another all-star. And how am I going to get this guy out? <laughs> I mean, he hit it pretty decently, but right on the ground. And Yohan Mancata, with a decent game himself, steps on third and throws the first. So I thought it was a very, very difficult position to put him in, a position where I would have been blaming Pedro today, right now, if Michael Kopech would have blew that right there. Because with... A clean inning, I would have understood, yeah, that's a higher leverage in situation, even a clean inning in the ninth inning. But coming into the eighth inning with only one out with that situation, I was like, whew, for a guy that does all the stuff that Michael Kopech does and all the stuff that happens in his mind, he calmed down and got the out. He was onions in the eighth inning, and we saw what he did in the ninth inning. I mean, you can't – anytime I see somebody shake off another guy, especially Michael Kopech, and you said he, what, he threw 30 of 38 fastballs. Can I update it? Because I was wrong. I, I was like, oh, I'll just throw out a number, right? It had to be a lot of fastballs. He threw 39 pitches. How many of them were fastballs? I would 39 say 39 pitches. 33 of them. 
35. I didn't know that he could throw more than 60%. I mean, I thought that, you know, maybe he'd go up to 70, 30%. But, I mean, even last game out, I think he threw two sliders on 17 pitches. I mean, it's just... I'm going to the bullpen and you're see if you can hit hundred miles per hour. And so far, I mean, the only person that can prove it is Marcelo Zuna. Oh. So I guess there's that. <laughs> yeah. That the pitch that he threw to Ozuna, he shook off oh. Martin Maldonado. And usually when I see somebody shake off, you usually shake to a fastball, especially a guy like Kopech mm -hmm. apparently didn't feel love for his curve or his slider today. And he's like, I'm going to try to blow this past one of the premier power hitters in the game. And he's like, nah, gone. Mercy. Like, right off the bat, right. everybody in the stadium knew it. Michael knew it. Everybody knew it. And it's kind of like the nuclear Lelouch thing. I'm sure Martin Maldonado is like, man, you out here throwing this good-ass uh, game, and you shake me off. I know what I'm doing. I know what he's sitting on. <laughs> and he sat on it, and he absolutely delivered. So I hope Michael takes the lesson of, man, great to have a save. Awesome job. Excellent performance by me. But never shake off your catcher, especially a veteran like Martin Maldonado. He knows what he's doing back there. Yeah, and it's it's middle in. I mean, it's it's a fat pitch to hit. It's not like he even threw it on the outside corner. It's not like he challenged him up and in. I mean, he was consistently up and in with his fastball to pretty much every other hitter besides Ozuna. Let's go to that ninth inning. He faced Olsen as his first batter. First pitch was fouled off by Olsen, 99 mile per hour forcing fastball. Second pitch was a called strike, 98 mile per hour forcing fastball. And then the third pitch was fouled off 100 miles per hour. So he's in an 0-2 count, throws a slider, gets a pop-up, gets the first out of the inning. And look looked extremely clean and then Ozuna comes up throws ball one low in the zone second pitch ball two low in the zone and then again middle in and Ozuna hits it to the moon I mean the fundamental deck I, I don't think it went farther than Luis Robert Jr.'s homer on Saturday but man it was close uh, Duvall then comes up first pitch strike 97 miles per hour and we saw that consistently from Kopech in this outing uh, him taking a little bit off on the first pitch to get that strike, not a bad strategy. Let's go. I mean, Hey, if you're going to throw 97 and then crank it up four more miles per hour and throw one Oh one, I don't think that's a, a bad strategy at all, but a uh, second pitch curve missed for a ball one, one, uh, then third pitch, a whiff on one Oh one. And then the fourth pitch, a whiff on a hundred. So that's a pretty nice at bat there to bounce back from the Homer. And then just really struggled at the end. And I don't know if he had the stamina to go 39 pitches because he throws eight pitches to Michael Harris. Harris was falling off a ton of fastballs. Uh, he had one slider that was pretty good, but wasn't able to locate it. It was the fifth pitch, uh, made it a 2-2 count, a slider that was a ball, and then Harris fouls off a fastball, and then Kopech's not able to hit the zone with the next two fastballs for balls, and then Harris gets walked, and then Arcia comes up, and that's the play where I think he made a decent pitch. Again, it's it's a 2-2 pitch. He goes to, I think, a cutter. Uh, it takes a little bit off, but I think it was a cutter and not a four-seamer, and that's why you see the, the dip in velocity. And Arcia hits it hard, 96 miles per hour, and it just bounces over Yon's uh, glove. I know you mentioned Yon having an, uh, an okay game. I don't know exactly the word that you use, so my bad on that. But I, I was really happy with Moncada. Uh, he had a hit today, and I thought he was really good at, at first base. He looks very fresh, and with you seeing how many players seemed cold and stiff out there, Moncada seemed loose and ready. Uh, there was one weird... Weird, I think at bat in the eighth where he looked weird on his plant foot. Uh, and I was like, uh oh, here we go. Uh, but he seemed all right. And we saw again uh, at, at, in the ninth inning uh, against Darno, um, he was able to feel that pop up and uh, get out of the inning. And, and the, the Sox were able to win. So, I mean, Kopech, not great. I don't think that we saw closer stuff, but. I don't think with a guy that had so many confidence issues like he's had so far, it's bad that he goes out against the Braves and gives up a, a, an earned run, but he had the cushion, the insurance run, and he got the save. I think that you just walk away with the result and say, I didn't really blow this for my team. I put them in the right position and let's go to the next day and move on, right? Like, I, I think this is great for Kopech and obviously great for the Sox that they don't lose another one-run game. <laughs> now they are, uh, what, one and two? Uh, or Yeah, yeah, one and two in uh, one-run games? No, one and three, because no, they lost the one first three, three uh, by yeah. three. So they're they're one and three in one-run games. So, hey, we got one. As somebody said in the uh, comments, like, it might not be a great game by Michael Kopech, but I hope he takes the lesson of, man, I just beat one of the best teams in baseball, and I did it in an inning in two-thirds. It's pretty solid. And he takes that confidence into the next time he's in a high-leverage situation 
whether it's a start uh, a closing situation or he comes into the sixth inning and needs to fire hose that inning off. So that is a good thing. He can have a nice uh, beer shower tonight for his first save. Same thing with Garrett Crochet for his first uh, win as a starter. And we're going to talk more about Garrett Crochet after the break. Luke saying in the chat, Kopech was scary to watch this close. If he knew how to command the fastball, he would be a lockdown closer. I think if he just had any trust of any pitch besides it. Because, I mean, you look at the stat cast heat map. I didn't, I didn't have it pulled up uh, for Kopech, but it's all at the top of the zone. I mean, that's what I talked about all offseason was this fastball is godly uh, when he throws it up in the zone. It's so flat. It's tough to square up. The pitch that Ozuna knocked out of the park was low in the zone. So it was able to he was easier to square up. Like, I really do think that Kopech showed, especially even, even in the last outing, that the fastball has it, it, it's an 80 grade pitch. I mean, it might even be a 90 grade fastball. I understand that it doesn't go past 80, but I guess I'm saying it breaks the scale. I mean, it's truly, again, Nuke Lelouch, Ricky Vaughn stuff where this guy has a blazing fastball and has no idea uh, just like really the confidence to, to throw it like he needs to it, it, and or he just has no other pitch besides this. It's a fascinating player to watch, but Herb, uh, let's tell people about Lion and Kugel. To me, nothing says summer like hanging out with your people, whether you're at the ball game or a cookout or just chilling like a line and Kugel summer shandy. I know you're saying that Herb, summer shandy is only a seasonal beer, but what can I drink throughout the year instead of just summer shandy? And if you have the guaranteed rate field, if not drinking a summer shandy, you're doing it wrong. But they have the Liney's original, light lager, lakeside cherry, juicy peach, berry weiss, Northwoods, Northwoods amber, dark lager, and so many more. And usually at the studio, I'm drinking a sunset wheat <laughs> or one of those lakeside cherries. And also they have the honey vice, which is made with real Wisconsin honey. So you know it's good. And if you ever tried any of the Line and Kugel flavors, you know they bring it. So for any occasion, go and get you some Line and Kugel. For over 150 years, Line and Kugel has had combined German brewing traditions with Wisconsin innovation. You don't have to just pick one. Line and Kugel has popular variety packs that come with four flavors, so you can try your favorite in those. Flavor life simple moments with Line and Kugels, the official craft beer of Chicago White Sox. Go to liney.com slash C-H-G-O to find delivery options near you. That's L-E-I-N-I-E dot com slash C-H-G-O or pick up Line of Kugels pretty much anywhere they sell beer. Line of Kugels. Hello. Go ahead. No, you're good. You're good. No, go, go. Oh, I cut Line you of off. Kugels. Flavor of the moment. Celebrate responsibly. The Jacob Line of Kugel Brewing Company. Chippewa Falls. Yes. yes. That's that's the point I need to I can cut you off. That's the, we gotta, I gotta wait for the, yes. I, I was just a little uh, too okay. trigger happy there. Uh, Herb, no, I just, I'm, I'm so excited to let people know about Circus Sportsbooks. Uh, I shouldn't give out gambling advice. That's for sure. But I guess the one gambling advice I will give you is to download the Circus Sports app. Uh, go over to circusports.com slash Illinois dash app. I was asked before today's game, will Garrett Crochet go over five and a half strikeouts? And I said, no way. There's no way. It's too cold. His <laughs> fastball won't work. Stupid me, but I'm not stupid because I have downloaded the Circus Sports uh, app and I have seen the world's largest sports book at my fingertips. And you can just tell that uh, a they're looking to take care of you. They have real people behind the app that resolve issues in a timely fashion, unlike other books who use chat uh, chat bots. And Circa doesn't limit players based on their winning. Every player has the same limits, unlike other books who do limit winning players. And they want you to see how good their app is. They want to see to show off how good their odds are. They encourage you to download other sports books to see how great the lines are over at Circa. So if you are looking for the I would call it the heaven of sports betters, go check out Circa Sports Illinois. The Circus Sports Illinois app at circusports.com slash Illinois dash app. That's circusports.com slash Illinois dash app to sign up today. Also be on lookout for Circa events, watch parties, and tailgates. If you or somebody you know may have a problem with gambling, call 100 Gambler 1 800 426 2537. Text GMB to 833 234 or visit com. All right, Sarah, let's flash the starting pitcher graphic for today. We'll see what Garrett Crochet and Reynaldo Lopez did. And then we will go to the Garrett Crochet video that, uh, Vinny Duber sent in from Guaranteed Rate Field. Crochet today, seven innings pitched, one earned run, three hits, eight Ks, and one walk. Right now, the Lopez, six innings, one earned run, four hits, five Ks, and two walks. Let's hear from the big lefty himself, the big crochet hooks. Maybe the you know the big unit, Herb, the big, the big hook? The big hook works. The big hook? All right, let's hear from the big hook, Garrett Crochet. 
really, it seemed like all spring you've had a really good rhythm on the mound, work quickly. Is that something you focus on? Yeah, yeah. Um, talking to some of the other guys about uh, just being patient up there, and the, that, that's kind of dictated by my tempo. Um, but I kind of hone in on that and catch play before I step on the rubber uh, pregame and uh, kind of just let it ride from there. You talked in the spring about wanting to be a guy who goes out and can go seven every five days. What's it feel like to have done it the first couple of times here? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Um, I was talking with some of the guys in the dugout. I mean, since I got to college, that's maybe like the third time I've ever got to the seventh. So I was, that, that was huge for me. Uh, um, just nice to get back there because, like I said, it was a little unfamiliar territory. But, uh, to, you know, to get there this early on and especially when we needed to win, you know, that's awesome. Did you feel good? Physically? Yeah, yeah, felt good. You mixed in the cutter a decent amount too. I mean, a little bit. How, how is that helping your repertoire overall? Uh, it's worked pretty well. Yeah, I, I, I don't even know how to guess how many I threw, but I threw quite a few today. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's been a good pitch for me so far. Just kind of gets guys off the off the four seam. Um, the, the characteristics of it aren't aren't too drastically positive or, or negative or anything like that. But but it seems to work. So yeah, just keep doing it. Ethan was saying that there can be some natural cut to your heater sometimes. Can you kind of tap into that when you use that cutter a little bit? Is that how it becomes an easy pitch for you to come in? Definitely. Uh, yeah, and it kind of, it kind of, I guess, kind of introducing this allowed me to just let my heater be what it is um, and, and not having to force it because I, I feel like before I, I've kind of tried to get around it a little bit, maybe not intentionally, but but if I was going glove side for sure, um, and, and the cutter just makes it easier to get there. Just to win, uh, you know, after the old four star, sound like you were enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, huge team win. Um, you know, it was gritty, especially there at the end. Kopech really la laid it all on the line for us. Um, and yeah, huge team win. Confidence has not seemed to be an issue at all for you the first couple goes here. I mean, what does the results do to boost that confidence even more? Yeah, um, just having conviction in my stuff. Um, and, and like I said, I, I guess before opening day, you know, I kind of had a steady build of that throughout spring. so. Results-wise, uh, I'm not too concerned. It, uh, I'm more concerned with my strike percentage and stuff like that. And when I'm competing in the zone and uh, and having good results, I, I suppose it does boost the confidence. But but just being all around the plate and, and the feedback from Maldi has been really good. What's it been like working with Maldonado? It's been awesome. Um, I mean, he's caught some incredible guys in the past, and his uh, his track record's definitely unmatched. And uh, for a young guy like myself to to really be able to lean on him has been awesome. Just overall, just what did you feel were the keys to your success? Uh, just establishing the fastball early. Um, yeah, I feel like I was kind of throwing everything for strikes too. So uh, I feel like when I'm when I'm throwing the way I am today, it's uh, you can kind of really point to anything. And what did it mean to be able to build off start one, two, start two as well? Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I don't really have a whole lot for you. It, it was cool, yeah, but um, but it, it's. I mean, tomorrow this start's going to be in the past, um, so it's really not really building from one start to the next. It's just giving it my all every time I go out there. I don't know if you got a beer shower over it or anything, but your first win as a starter, is that a meaningful milestone? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. I was actually just talking to Fetty about that. Um, yeah, no shower for that, thank <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, very meaningful. What's it mean to have a guy like Kopech down there? I mean, you worked in that role. He's worked in that role, right. actually, before. But what's it mean you know, to have a guy who you can count on like that? A hundred percent, yeah. All the guys have trust in him, especially when he comes in. And he, and he's just warming up at every pitch he throws to click a million. And when his curveball is working like it was today, I mean, he didn't really have to go to it a whole lot because he was throwing 100. But uh, I, I think that that was a huge step in the right direction and uh, for his confidence. And I think that he's going to just continue to have the success in that role. So you missing that rule game yet? <laughs> not quite, not yet. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Garrett. We really appreciate it. And here's the thing. I love Vinny Duber, but we just saw the filmed media pool the scrum right there and there was no question about his tattoo is oh, it a yeah. kraken is it a soxtopus what's going on Vinny? what are you doing there i mean you, you spend f five hours there and you can't ask the guy about the tattoo we'll follow up maybe he did maybe he did off screen we'll have to see uh let's talk a little bit more about garrett crochet we do have some super chats that i want to get to thank you to fran chili who said might have had a few too many jack and cokes but world series here we come <laughs> so thank you for the five dollar <laughs> super chat fran chili and uh baloney fonseca saying the crotch rocket patent pending i don't I, yeah you know I, I i don't hate it i don't hate it herb but I like the I big think, hook a little bit more because it's 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 the nod to Randy Johnson and Garrett Crochet is Randy Johnson. And what it lightly. Crochet literally translates to hook. 
exactly. in English. So exactly, yeah. exactly. I know you're a Dutch speaker. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a Dutch speaker. I'm a uh, what a scientist, a doctor here too. A doctor. I, yeah. I think you're a, a, a gold artist recording uh, or a gold record uh, recording artist as well. Um, but yeah, you know, yeah. watch me speak Dutch right now. Hello. Hmm. There you go. That's a, that's a um, all right. Let's go to crochet. That one didn't hit that much. The biggest thing is how does he feel after these starts? And I guess the biggest thing that I'm realizing after watching crochet is as long as he feels like he's checking off boxes and he feels good and they're managing him correctly. Let's go. Let's see how this project plays out. I'm not as worried as I once was with this because we don't really know what to expect, but obviously it's worth throwing him out there for six innings and seven innings because he's been absolutely fantastic. He talked about establishing that fastball in the zone and I got a stat for you, Herb. OK, face 21 batters. He had 18 first pitch strikes. I mean, that's what you need to be. I mean, that's what you need to do as a starter. And he even said at the end there, like he's not taking this into the next start. It's just that is my start. I'm going to regain my energy. And then, in, you know, five days from now, it's a new day. I don't think Michael Kopech has that same mentality. That's why he really didn't make it as a starter. And here we go with Crochet. That confidence oozes off of him, and he looks phenomenal. Through 93 pitches today, and the fastball was up 0.3 miles per hour. So he's obviously feeling good physically because, I mean, the fastball's still playing. It's freezing cold and raining out there, and he's still touching, you know, 98, 99 consistent, consistently. So I, I'm over the moon with Crochet. This, is, this has been fantastic to watch. After the Detroit start, I looked at it and I was like, man, amazing to do this in your initial start in the major leagues after not starting any other game in your professional career and not starting since you were a what sophomore at Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And then I said after that, I was like, the hell's coming to breakfast your next start when you face the Atlanta Braves. Gary Crochet said, no, Gary Crochet is coming to the Atlanta Braves and hell's coming for them. Amazing. Just look at that lineup up and down. I know that Murphy's not in there, but you have to start the game off with Ronald Acuna Jr., the reigning NL MVP. We saw what the offense can do on Monday where they exploded for nine runs in eight innings. Gary Crochet looked at that team and you said it. He faced 21 batters. He's like, OK, here's a strike on 18 of them to start the at bat. Hit it. Can you? No, you can't. Enjoy. Enjoy what you're doing. And I think the uh, Marce uh, the Marcel Azuna home run and the hit uh, later on in the game, I forgot who hit the ball to right field for the double. Those were results of tiring at the end of the game. I think the Marcel Azuna was like at pitch like 85 and the other one was like at pitch 91. But he's just working through the, the roster and also working through his own um, lactic acid in his arms and his leg and trying to pitch with that. I, there was somebody in the chat, I think it was Jared CWS that said, do you put him back out there for the seventh inning? And it was 79 pitches at that time. I was like, yes, because he's on fire. He's got nothing going right now. But also if he goes on the same path that he was going at that time at like 13 pitches per inning, he'll end at 92 pitches, which coincidentally he ended on. But mm -hmm. the man is just, unbelievable and like you said the only thing that's going to stop this man is just not doing this job every day and then you know tired fatigue arm will happen things like that will happen but if he feels that he's not going to stop and innings limits are not a thing for him which I and you bristled at what he said in spring training if it's not a thing man this guy is the best pitcher I've seen Start his White Sox career probably in a long time. Hey, well, there, there you go. I mean, he, he set a record. Uh, he has the most strikeouts uh, for any White Sox pitcher in their first two major league strikes, strike uh, or starts. Sorry, uh, 15 strikeouts is the most for any White Sox pitcher in their first two career starts. Uh, we do have another uh, super chat and uh, thank you uh, to Adam. Uh, love you all. Started a channel. Let me know if you dig what he's doing. So uh, go check out uh, Shy Town Real Estate's uh, channel uh, and, and see if you like what uh, Adam's putting up there. Uh, thank you also for the super chat. <laughs> I didn't mean to, I just wanted to make sure that message got across. Uh, we got a couple more on crochet. Um, either the know we're supposed to take a break, but let's talk about, no, let's take a break. Let's take a break. Okay. 
uh i'll, I'll be brave let's point. take a break uh, i i, I want to sing honestly i just got to be honest i want to sing the the empire jingle so are you ready herb <laughs> ready oh. five five eight eight two three hundred empire, empire today all right with empire today you get shop at home convenience the right products for your needs same room yeah, no, I mean, we're, we did our best. <laughs> the right product for your needs. Quick and professional installation in a low price guarantee. Empire today is the best place to get new flooring. So, of course, they have copycats, but Empire cannot be beaten on their quality, service, and speed. So competitors advertise low-quality products that Empire simply won't carry. And Empire won't promise the lowest prices because anyone who does is putting flooring in your home that they wouldn't put in theirs. Empire keeps shopping for floors simple with a curated product selection. And their philosophy is to help you find what you need, not overwhelm you with thousands of choices and substitutes. What they leave out of their selection is just as important as what they put in, and their product team exhaustively combs through thousands of product samples each year to find the perfect styles that will look great in your home. And you can check out those styles with their virtual floor designer. It's a great way to see how new floors will look in any space. It's easy. Just snap a picture of your room and instantly see how new floors can change them. So schedule a free in-home estimate today over at empiretoday.com slash CHGO. All listeners can receive a $350 off discount when they use promo code CHGO. Restrictions do apply, but see empiretoday.com slash CHGO for details. This year, we have three scheduled takeovers. And t takeovers is when Sean and I Meet you who are out there who want to go to a White Sox game at the game. We have seats in section 147 for three of the games. Memorial Day, May 27th versus the Toronto Blue Jays, a one o'clock start. Then I think it's a, the Dodgers at June 24th. So Shoei Otani, Mookie Betts, uh, Freddie Freeman, et cetera, et cetera. June 24th, we'll be there, 147. And then for the Chicago Cubs, August 9th. You have Cody Bellinger in town. You get to see the White Sox on a Saturday night and also fireworks. How great oh. can that be? I mean, fireworks on the field after they beat the Cubs and then fireworks after the game. You can see that. And as I said, our seats are in section 147, which is the third baseline. And if you are a diehard member, you get 20% off of those tickets. And uh, Sean, I also think that if you buy a package of all three, you can, uh, if you uh, go to the allchgo.com and see our event, you can buy a package for all three. Yes, and get go a, to the 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 first one, go to the, the May 27th one, and you'll be able to get that deal. Yeah, and so if you're a diehard, you get 20% off of those deals. So why not become a diehard today? You get amazing shows every day. You get Vinny's newsletter every Monday. You get to participate in our click to pick game if you are in our Discord, which Jared CWS is doing this week. And man, that Discord is just going off during the game. Just every pitch, there's somebody just commenting on different things. It's very intelligent baseball talk going in our Discord. And that CH show, we have podcasts and live shows every day from every team, including the White Sox, the Cubs, the Bulls, the Bears, the Hawks. And premium written contact, just like we said, at allchgo.com. Our own Vinny Duber, our beat reporter, has an uh, article mostly every day. And then on Mondays for diehards, he brings out a White Sox Weekly exclusively for only those people. Uh, dope merch for every team. Free shirt when you become a member. And we have our new shirts, our Defend the South Side shirt, which I wore yesterday in the show, or our Sunday Fun Day, which I'm probably going to wear on this Sunday on the show. And you can get those shirts New releases at chgolocker.com or our Chicago collection, which we released a couple of weeks ago. Great shirt. Uh, the South, the Second City shirt is the one I got. You can get one of these other shirts that are up there. Uh, I don't see it on the screen. I, Sarah's doing things, so it's she's busy. But we have plenty of shirts at the chgolocker.com. So go there right now. Remember, become a diehard at allchgo.com slash diehard. You get free T-shirt. 20% off merch, 20% off of takeovers, 20% off of shirts, uh, hats, gloves, cups, all those things. And come to our uh, Die Hard right now. And you can even get that Southside Bias shirt if you like. So allchgo.com slash Die Hard to become one of us. One all right. of us. One, one of, us. of us. One of us. I thought you were going to say Vinny Duber's name three times and then he was going to appear uh, like uh, Bloody Juice. Mary or whatever. Yeah, Beetlejuice. There you go. Oh, my Boom. God. <laughs> 
I did not know that you were backstage. That I, I feel like that's real kismet. Uh, joining us from Guaranteed Ray Field, it's Beetlejuice himself. Uh, I guess Beetlejuice also wears the Southpaw mascot. Uh, you can follow him at Vinny Duper. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. We already played the Garrett Crochet video, but what'd you make of his second start, man? I mean, it was fantastic, right? I mean, how how could you be not be very, very impressed, uh, not just with what he did in, you know, in, in a small, uh, in the micro, right. With, which today, which is going up against a really good Braves lineup and just dominating. But in the macro too, we were all kind of a little surprised by what he did on opening day. And then the question is, can he do it again? The answer is yes. And, you know, he, he even topped it in to, to some extent with going out for a se seventh inning um, and really just continuing to fill up the strike zone, be efficient, like we talked about uh, last week when he made that start on opening day, um, but doing it against just a really, really good lineup and a really good collection of hitters. Um, talking to Pedro Grifol, and I think, you know, once you heard the manager say this, it kind of clicked in my mind at least, being like, oh, yeah, that is what happened. He said, you know, the velocity was outstanding at the start, which, you know, you'd expect from Garrett Crochet with what he's been doing in the spring and last week. But then he became a pitcher, right? And he had to go out and get get outs and continue to get strikeouts and do it in impressive fashion, but maybe not just by blowing it past everybody, even though the velocity stayed stayed high. But um, uh, I, I think that assessment from Pedro was a good one. And, and like I said, it kind of clicked with me. So um, he is just continuing to impress on every single level. The confidence is high. He still doesn't he, – he, he told me today – he after the game he does not as you saw in the in the video you played he doesn't care what the result was right as long as, as the pitching's going well well guess what the results are going well too um and they're going really really well at least through two starts here you can see the dichotomy of the two pitchers that uh we pretty much are going to focus on Jericho Shea is ridiculous like you asked him about confidence and his answer was real confident too not cocky just Matter of fact, hey, I'm good type of thing. And then Michael Kopech, who's been doing this at the major league level for a while. And you can see confidence waiting in and out every time he goes to the mound, even in the game. Like he was kind of confident in some pitches. He was kind of trying to throw the ball through Martin Maldonado, some of the pitches. Just the dichotomy of those two pitches. And that man starting his second game versus the best team, probably offensively in the game. And he's like, ho hum, get out of here, guys. I'm just going to be. Um, a boss on the mound like do you guys who have done this for like 12 13 14 years like take is he taking you guys aback a little bit about how matter of fact he is after the you guys talk to him because he doesn't seem very impressed with himself and i'm just over the moon over this guy well, I mean, I, I don't think taken aback is maybe the right phrasing, but it's noticeable, right? And I think the idea is that these kind of athletes come, or, come along, and he is now one of them where um, the, the confidence is, is obvious. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is matter of fact. It is a little almost ho-hum, um, you know, and I think we saw that a little bit in, its, in a different way with Dylan Cease. Um, but we're seeing it uh, kind of be very obvious with Garrett Crochet. And uh, listen, I, I think... So many people, I mean, hell, we, we spent the spring talking about, was this possible? Was Could he possibly do this job? Could he possibly do this job well? Could he possibly do this job a lot, you know, in terms of workload? And what he was doing, what, the, the way he got this chance in the first place was just going to, or, you know, talking with Chris Getz and being like, yeah, I want to do this because I think I can do it. And I think, you know, we, Sean, you and certainly the other, other folks, Herb and I were probably among among them uh, at a time, at least, were, were like, what has he done to deserve this, right? And I think they gave him the chance probably because of the type of confidence that you're seeing, and then he goes out and, and matches it with, with the results, with the output. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say taken aback, Herb, but it is certainly noticeable, and it is a feature, not a bug, of of, of what you're seeing from him right now. I'm taken aback, as you mentioned. Like I, I remember you bringing this up. I think it was June or July of last year mm -hmm. that Garrett Crochet wants to be a starter. And it's like, yeah, I want to be an astronaut, buddy. Like, of course, starters get paid more and they get more, you know, shine and they get to help out the team a little bit more. He shut me up, I think, with the first throw a pitch of opening day, and he just continues to dominate. We talked about the impressive just ability to get 
ahead of pitch, uh, hitters as well. I, I, I used the stat already. 18 of 21 first pitch strikes to batters. Uh, only one walk again, one walk uh, to 15 strikeouts in his first uh, 13 innings. I mean, he's been fantastic. Before I go to some nerd stats, Vinny, I kind of called you out because we saw four minutes of you chatting with Garrett Crochet, and we didn't see any questions about the Soxtopus on his arm. Is it a Soxtopus? Is it an octopus? Do we have more clarification? <laughs> we do not. Uh, that's going to have to be. That's going to have to be an off. That's going to have to be something that is asked in the four days when he's not starting, uh, because right. I think that would just uh, uh, that would throw such a wrench into the post game press conference that I'm not sure that the post game press conference could recover. Uh, we got a Louis, Louis appreciate it. No worries about that. Uh, Louie with the $5 super chat. Uh, Sox in San Diego in late September. Let's do a sh uh, show at the Chicago bar out here then. Uh, you all do a great job. Appreciate the coverage. Thank you. You guys want to go to San Diego at the end of the year? I'm a, I'm all in. You know me. I'm always good for San yeah. Diego. That's your spot. Let's Set go it up, see Louis. Dylan Cease. Set it up, Louie. I, yeah. I want to ask um, Vinny, and we were talking earlier about the situation that Pedro put – Michael Kopech into in the eighth inning. Did Pedro speak about why he went with Michael Kopech after it looked like Brebbia struck out Rana on Cunha and then they threw out the guy at second? Why he put him in such a high leverage situation? Because I got to put my hand up. If that would have failed, I would have been like, man, what are we doing out there? But it seems like Pedro just wants to put Michael Kopech to the test and Michael Kopech came through with flying colors. Yeah, I mean, certainly after what we saw from Michael on Sunday uh, against Detroit, I think, I mean, listen, remember when, when this move was made, when they put, when they said that Kopech was going to be going back to the bullpen, uh, it was brought up uh, by Pedro, I believe, not because it was a question that was asked down in Arizona, but by Pedro, oh, maybe be closer, maybe be closer. You know, we haven't heard anything like, oh, we need to have a set closer, we need to have a set closer. But remember last year when Reynaldo Lopez got all those safe situations early, it sure kind of looks like Michael Kopech might be the White Sox closer, doesn't it? Um, and uh, we'll see, obviously, how that plays out. But that was a spot in which he needed to go to his closer. It's back-to-back -back walks by Brebbia. And remember, too, Pedro, uh, you know, talks about identifying parts of a lineup in which he wants specific pitchers to pitch against. And so uh, that obviously very well could have had something to do with it more than the fact that Brebbia walks two guys in a row. But listen, Kopech gets out of that. You know, not without walking his own guy first. And then in the ninth inning, Pedro said he was going to let Kopech decide the game. Whether it was a whether it ended up being a win or a loss, he was going to let Kopech do it. And and listen, there's there's I think you know uh, people love more than anything to pick apart a, a manager's bullpen management. But I think in a season where you're trying to find out if Michael Kopech can be that ninth inning guy for you, maybe to put him out there in that situation and let him either sink or swim um, is probably helpful in that learning experience for the team. So um, uh, you know, M Michael I thought was impressive in his own way tonight. Um, Certainly, like I said, eventful, uh, particularly in the ninth inning with the with the home run and then with the walks that, that end up loading the bases. But uh, he said that really could have unraveled tonight on him, and it didn't, uh, partially because of Martin Maldonado. You saw him go to the mound a few times uh, tonight. I mean, in fact, I think they used all of their mound visits. Um, you saw Ethan Katz come out as well at one point. But I asked Michael, hey, last year, Nights like that, or you know, a situation like that did unravel a, a lot. And he and I said, What was the difference between having success tonight and not doing so a year ago? And he said, He kept the same mentality, he didn't get out of the mindset of attacking, of going after the strike zone, which maybe he struggled with last year. He said he kept that bulldog mentality. Um, that might be a new, a new feature, or a new strategy, or a new approach. Um, and listen, it, it hasn't been uh clean. We'll put it that way in the in two of the three appearances that that Michael has made so far, but they've all been scoreless or I shouldn't say that they've all been they've all they've all worked, you know, and and to, to see him get out of those, I think, is a much bigger step than, um, you know, having him go out there and have three fly balls in a row and, and not necessarily face that test. So that is important, whether or not it ends up being consistent, we'll find out. But 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 it certainly is interesting to see him be able to get out of those situations, which last year he was not able to do. Yeah, go find that dent in the left field seats and tell Marcelo Ozuna that he had a scoreless inning. Yeah. I mean, yeah, mercy, I, cor I corrected myself quick. <laughs> <laughs>
just messing with you. Uh, I, I got I got two things I want to follow up on. Uh, first, let's just stick with Kopech. Um, did he talk about pitch selection? Obviously, you talk about him being aggressive. Uh, he threw 17 pitches on Sunday. 14 of them were fastballs. Threw 39 pitches today. 35 of them were fastballs. Did he talk about how much he likes that fastball? I mean, does he have to? You you bring the you bring the numbers up every time, and certainly the numbers that I'm watching here at the ballpark hitting triple digits. Mm-hmm. That is, that uh, goes to show you how uh, effective that pitch is. Before you even get into the fact of what you're talk of what you talk about so often, when you compare it to everybody else, and you show that it's not just good, it's one of the best out there. And I think you know he doesn't have to really explain himself on that front because you can look at those numbers and say, well, that's the pitch you should be throwing most of the time. Did he talk though specifically about the Ozuna thing? Because I think we saw the the reliance on the fastball usually was around like sixty four percent with the fastball. Now today he was ninety percent. Uh, Herb mentioned that he shook off uh, Martine in that two zero count through a fastball. Usually when you're shaking off, you're going from you know a breaking ball to a fastball. Did he talk about that decision to shake off? Did he talk about the decision to go two zero fastball to Ozuna, or was it just more you know he beat me? Yeah, I mean, I'd have to go back to see if that specific answer was given, but I I will say this. I mean, he's obviously very confident in that pitch, and it seems like he's a lot more confident just in general now than he is compared to a year ago where he's willing to take on guys in the strike zone. And, you know, I I think for him, throwing a strike is more important than, than, than it not getting hit, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, this is a guy who led the American League in walks last year. I think you'd rather see him stay in the strike zone and occasionally get hit versus continuing to, you know, not have it and 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 put guys on base uh, without them having to take the bat off their shoulder. Yeah, trusting him for 39 pitches. It was a long uh, relief roll, but he got it done. Uh, one more thing. I wanted to go to the eighth inning. We talked about that Brebbia moment where he looked like he – Rung up Acuna. Uh, Luke mentioned it in the chat. We saw Pedro bicker, and then he goes out and has a chat with the umpire, and maybe they have a longer chat than most uh, managers do. Did Pedro talk about that pitch? Did he talk about not even getting rung up, too? Because I thought, oh, he's going out there. He's going to stand on that mountain. He's going to berate this umpire. I, I th- you know, We didn't see that anger from Pedro. I don't know if he addressed it post-game. He didn't, uh, you know. Obviously, when the game ends up going the way it does, it 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 makes it makes that a little less uh, of an important moment. But um, I mean, he did argue it, right? I mean, mm-hmm. some some umpires, I guess, just have a quicker trigger than others, right? I mean, I think there are some umpires where you've seen that exact interaction and they've and they've given the heave ho right away. You know, I mean, again, you're not supposed to argue balls and strikes at all, and if that's if that's what he was talking about, I'm sure. And, you know, to, to, to let him do that to that extent is probably just a good sign by that home plate umpire to let him blow off some steam instead of just, you know, throwing him out of the game right away. Um, and then on top of it too, that's a tight situation. I'm pretty sure Pedro wanted to manage the rest of that game, um, you know, and make sure that, that those things were going to happen. I understand, you know, from an entertainment standpoint, it's sometimes more fun to watch the manager go off, but uh, they had a game that they had to win. And I'm sure that he wanted to manage the rest of it, uh, even though obviously he was visibly displeased. Yeah. Hey, they're playing Bobby Cox's team. So I want, I want, you know, to get him, get his money's worth. Let's go get ejected. Uh, Herb, what you got? Yeah. Sox manufactured a run the first run on a bunt walk sacrifice fly, or just a pop-up. And then a, Gavin Sheets, Duck Snort, and then a home run, and then this, pretty much the same thing with Andrew Vaughn coming up in the, I think, in the eighth. Like, I know that you'll take runs however you can do it. I think they got 11 runs now this this year in the five games they played. Was Pedro happy about how they manufactured those runs as part of this fast program? Because that was, you know, kind of what the White Sox are talking about, like putting on the bunts when you need to getting the guy over when you need to, and they kind of executed it late in the game. Yeah, he shouted out Ben Benintendi for the bunt single, obviously, uh, you know, and, and listen, that's a that's a gr- great call by him. I mean, this is a guy who is not finding it easy to get on base as the leadoff man of the team. Uh, and Herb, I mean, I think you talk about it all the time. If you If you can exploit it, go ahead and exploit it. And he did exactly that, and it produced a run. That is exactly what Pedro wants to see. And listen, we've watched this team hit. Uh, or not hit for five games now. And if there is a way in which they can outscore another team by not 
you know, having to outslug them or not having to, you know, r- rack up 10 hits on the scoreboard because they might not be able to do that on a regular basis. They'll absolutely take it. Uh, you know, if you're talking process over results, you might not like to see pop-ups, but the result is a single. And uh, certainly it goes down as a line drive in the scorebook, as they, uh, as the old saying goes. Um, take it where you can get it. And uh, if this team is going to pitch like this, this year, or at least every fifth day, they're going to pitch like this. Go ahead and and give uh, give them as many uh, three run games where two of the runs score on on drop or on pop ups that fall in uh, as they can handle. Because th- listen, uh, tonight they didn't need anything more than that because the pitching was that good. Do I win click to pick because of this? No, if anybody would be Vinny because his guy that he picked, Brand- Braden Shoemake, was pitch hit for. By Paul DeYoung, but I, I would even say hit no it. because he didn't pick Paul DeYoung. Yeah, no, no Sean way. Sean gets it. Sean yeah, gets it. it. Yeah, let's what? go. Benintendi let's go. Single? My, guy, My guy didn't do anything. <laughs> My guy hit a single too and walked. My guy scored a run. Hey, just my guy wasn't wasn't there. Your guy wouldn't have scored the run if my guy didn't walk behind him. Yeah, my guy wouldn't have scored a run if Austin Riley was playing in at all. I mean, it's not like Benny's a burner. I just love that he gets on first base, and it's not like he's a stolen base threat. Like, he's just standing there. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, I got some more on crochet. Uh, I do just want to go to uh, David Frank's comment. Uh, Herb Sprecket Netherlands, guilt to his eggs. Zit him up in Herb. Thoughts? Indeed. Do you want to respond? Okay. Uh, we also had uh, David Rock saying uh, that crochet is French. Guys, hook in Dutch is not crochet. It is French. Hook in French is crochet. Anyways, we're calling crochet, crochet the big hook. You like that, Vinny? Uh, a, 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 you know, a, a tip of the hat to the big unit, Randy Johnson. Uh, crochet, you use hooking, uh, hook, hook needles. Do we it's like not, the big hook? It's not bad. It's not bad. Mm. I, I don't dislike it. I, I think uh, he would have to have probably because it's baseball hook, you know, curveball. Mm. He doesn't really have that. So I don't know if it's perfect, but it's a good start. All right. Hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, let's go to some Garrett Crochet graphics here. Uh, let's see. Uh, first off, the called strike plus whiff one. I don't know if I uh, labeled that one. Sarah, just throw one up and we'll see what All happens. Right. Hey, that's the one I was talking about. Uh, he ended up being up 0.3 miles per hour on his fastball, which I think is just great to see. Uh, you just see him throw 80 plus pitches and the 90 plus pitches, and he still has life on his fastball. That's the biggest thing that I was worried about uh, this year. You see 58% fastballs, and he was you know brilliant with that pitch, and the cutter was phenomenal. He threw four. 14 of those. I know in the video, he said, I don't know how many I threw out there, but uh, they look great when he did throw them. And the biggest thing that stands out is first off that cutter on 14 pitches had a called strike plus whiff percentage of 57. I don't think I've ever seen a number over 50 uh, in the three years that we've ever done a show like this. And you see the slider 43% called strike plus whiff rate in the forcing fastball 30% for a total on those 93 pitches, a called strike plus whiff rate of 37%. An average MLB starter is 30%. So you see 16 called strikes. He's able to locate in the zone and locate four strikes. And a lot of that was early in OO counts and then able to get 14 whiffs, 38% whiff rate. I mean, it's just incredibly elite. And to do this against the Braves, I understand that it's cold out, but I mean, Garrett Crochet needs to check off as many boxes as possible, and he looks utterly fantastic. Uh, if you want to go to the other graphic too, Sarah, just to show off his stuff. And again, go follow Thomas Nistico. Uh, I don't know if I've ever tried to say his last name, but at TJ Stats, uh, and you could see that Crochet is still getting that great Velox uh, extension about seven feet, and that's elite for any starting pitcher. And you see the stuff plus in that uh, far category 108 for his four seamer, 100 is average for a major league pitcher. His slider 117, his cutter 104, and his changeup, even though he threw it two times, 111 uh, overall on the 93 pitches, a 110 stuff plus. So the fact that the stuff has stayed vibrant over these uh, starts just has me as a Sox fan, and I know a lot of people, uh, probably even Crochet himself, even though he wasn't showing it to the media just feeling electric about how he's going um i don't know if this is a trade piece for the white Sox. i've heard that a little bit i mean he's got three years of control left and that's a little bit of the issue with calling up and him up in 2020 and using him in 2021 he's got a year of control this year and then two more rb years is he a trade piece if if he looks this good do you try to unload him while he looks like Randy Johnson, or do you try to, you know, ride him for as long as you can? We saw, you know, cease wait until one year of control before they ended up dipping off of him. I don't I, think so. Yeah. I mean, it would seem to me that 
if you are trying to get this done, this rebuilding project in somewhat of an expedited fashion, you would say, man, three years from now and we're still, you know, waiting, that would be a little tough. Um, but also, you know, there's no, th I just think this is a guy that can be part of that future. Um, even if that future doesn't come as quickly as next year. And obviously we got to wait and see if that's the case or not. But um, if he keeps throwing like this, it's a guy you build around for sure. Yeah. And I know that Jerry is not a big fan of extending pitchers too deep. And you're playing a team that does all these extensions in the Braves. I don't know if they do necessarily pitchers like this, but with only three years left, I get what you're talking about, Sean, because, you know, he might be gone after two years and might be way too expensive for you after those two or three years he's pitching for the White Sox. But maybe some extension talks are going on early. You should have some, and you can get them on the cheap over here. And I know the injury concern is always out there because he had Tommy John already in the past, but – if this is the guy, and if you truly believe this is the guy, there's no reason you're not going to be talking about a 24-year-old top of the rotation lefty arm like that and saying, we want you until you're at least 30 or 30. Well, and maybe, too, gets giving him the goodwill of being a starter and being like, hey, we're going to give you all the runway in the world by giving you this, this extension. Maybe they're able to come to a deal. Point blank, period. I'm bringing it up because I've heard other people talk about it. I want this guy in a White Sox uniform until his arm falls off. I mean, even if he doesn't have a left arm, maybe he can throw with his right because he's pretty good with the left one. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he could figure it out. I'm all for Garrett Crochet being a White Sox. Uh, we have 95 likes so far, 130 people watching. I know that it's been a tough start for the White Sox season, but not a lot of yelling on this episode compared to the last one. So we'll take it. We'll take the White Sox win. We'll take a great outing from Garrett Crochet, a fun and exciting outing from Michael Kopech. Uh, anything else that we want to throw out there? I guess one question I had for you, Ben, uh, no more word on Aloy Jimenez. Obviously, it seems like they're taking it day to day. Was he available off the bench tonight, or is he just out until, you know, likely the Kansas City series starts until Thursday? I don't even know if you have a word on return, but like, would he be able to pinch hit at all tonight? I don't think so tonight. Um, in fact, the the phrasing that Pedro used would lead me to say that no, even though Pedro didn't say that. He said, you know, we he goes uh, that that he's much better than he was yesterday, Aloy. Um, but you know, when I said, so are you confident that he'll avoid going on the injured list? He said, we're pretty sure that's the that's what's going to happen, and that's why we haven't put him there yet. But he said, but he needs to continue making the sort of progress moving forward that he did from yesterday to today, which would lead me to believe that there was still maybe even that small chance that he does go on the IL if things don't progress, keep progressing that way. But it would definitely have led me to believe to say he wouldn't be playing tonight at all. And I think you saw him uh, on the broadcast down in the dugout, just kind of, just kind of chilling in a sweatshirt. So I, I don't think he was available tonight. No. All right. Anything else, sir? I don't have anything else. All right. Uh, we'll see if they play baseball tomorrow. It's supposed to snow in Chicago and a high of 38. Do we know the White Sox starter, Vin? We do not. And that was asked both pregame and postgame, and it was said to be Ooh. determined. Um, I would imagine that might have something to do with the fact that the game is a little bit up in the air uh, in terms of the weather tomorrow. But we'll see what happens. And no one, you didn't notice anybody in the dugout that was unfamiliar? No. The uh, uh, we did. I believe there was reporting from down in Charlotte tonight because they uh, they played this evening um, at AAA. And I believe we saw Justin Gershley say that uh, he was expecting Nick Nostrini to start there uh, tomorrow. So um, we'll see what happens. And maybe it's a bullpen day. Maybe it's something unexpected who or maybe they don't play at all. And we're just talking yeah. about the, uh, uh, the the four guys who have pitched so far pitching in that Kansas City series. And they have eight guys in the bullpen. Uh, well, they have nine guys in the bullpen, but now, I mean, you can just scratch off Kopech because he just threw 39 pitches. It's not like the guy that typically, hey, we can expect length from will be available. So should be fun tomorrow, huh? Tanner Banks. Right. Tanner Banks. Tanner Banks versus, uh, let's check our notes. Oh, Spencer Strider. Oh, that's an even <laughs> matchup right there. <laughs> Poor Tanner Banks. All right. Uh, no, fun show. Uh, appreciate everyone hanging out with us. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Uh, we will be here tomorrow, unsure of when. We will have a post game show for sure. Uh, but if we don't have a post game show because of the weather, we'll have an off day show. Sorry. So that's confusing. We'll have a show. 
wait for the weather. Follow Vinny Duber at Vinny Duber. Have updates from the park. Uh, but we'll either have a show tomorrow, whether it be a post game if they play or an off day if the game gets rained out. Follow Vinny at Vinny Duber. He's our CHGO White Sox beat writer. Follow Herb at Wall 23 He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. You can follow me at Sean underscore W underscore White Sox. Thank you to everyone for hanging out with us. And you can follow us at CHGO underscore White Sox. Thank you to Sarah for producing the show. And we will talk to you tomorrow. Uh, goodbye. We all silly like the mayor. 